Okay, hello, my name is Elias Redstone and I am the Artistic Director of Photo 2022 International Festival of Photography here in Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Boon Wurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of Melbourne. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm really delighted to introduce this talk as part of our international season of Photo Live, presented in partnership with our partners Autograph in London. Um, the program features 10 online conversations between artists, photographers and curators from Australia and the UK that will explore ide ideas of identity and belonging in the context of human rights, representation and social justice. This program really highlights the importance of centering Black, Indigenous, feminist, queer and other marginalised voices in storytelling and photography. Photo Live is supported by the British Council and is presented as part of the UK Australia season 2021 to 22, a collaboration between the British Council and the, the Australian government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. For each talk, an artist from one country is in conversation with a curator from the other country. The conversation will last uh, for about 40 minutes and then we'll, um, uh, within that time, there'll be questions. So feel free to leave questions at any time during the talk using the Q&A function. If you would like to access captions, please click closed captions if you're watching this live and select subtitles. So for this session, we are joined by the artist, Dean Cross, and the director of Autograph, Mark Seely. Good evening. Dean Cross was born and raised on Ngunnawal, Ngambri country, and is of Warim, um, Warimi descent. He is a transdisciplinary artist, primarily working across installation, sculpture, and photography. His career began in contemporary dance, performing in choreography nationally and internationally for over a decade with Australia's leading dance companies. Following that, Dean retrained as a visual artist, gaining his bachelor's degree from Sydney College of the Arts and a first class honours from the ANU School of Art and Design. His work has been collected extensively and has held significant public and private collections, including the National Gallery of Victoria, the Art Gallery of South Australia, Queensland University of Technology Art Museum, and the Canberra Museum and Gallery. He is represented by Yavuz Gallery, Sydney and Singapore. Mark Seeley has been Director of Autograph since 1991. He was awarded the Hood Medal for Services to Photography in 2007 by the Royal Photographic Society and in January 2013 was awarded an MBE for Services to Photography. He completed a PhD at Durham University where his research focused on photography and cultural violence. He has curated several major exhibitions, including African Cosmologies at PhotoFest Biennial 2020, and has published extensively, including his recent publication, Decolonizing the Camera, Photography in Racial Time. Okay, Mark, I will hand over to you. I'm looking forward to Thank you very much. Um, good morning or good evening, everybody. And um, I think because time is so short, we'll just, uh, we'll just jump straight into it, I think, Dean. Dean, no. we, um, we spoke the other, the other day and, and great to catch up. And I love the idea that you've got a background in, in performance and you know, centering the body in many ways within your work. I thought that's really quite a, an interesting way to move from the kind of physical to the actual visual, visual art world. And we also, through, through, through our kind of conversation, recognize that we share an anniversary in terms of the visual space. And I wondered whether, 19, whether we should talk about 1988, which is such a specific year. One is the year in which kind of autograph is um, formally constituted. And I could argue that we share, that you share a kind of formal kind of constitution in terms of the making process as a, <laughs> as a visual artist. And you start that making process through, um, of all things, 1998 video. <laughs> 1988. It was very much the kind of, it was very much the kind of pencil of the moment um, that people were beginning, especially lots of artists were drawing to. So it was a new kind of way of, uh, and, a, and a radical art form, which certainly the art, the art world was only just beginning to embrace itself. So it's quite a bold move to talk and move into video. And I wonder whether you would just take us through or help us explain or, 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 or articulate you know, that, that, that juncture for you, that really important kind of crossroads. Yeah, the, you mean the move from sort of dance into the visual realm? Yes. Yeah, just, so just, 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 just very quickly in that space. I think that I, I felt that I had reached my limit as a dancer in the sense of um, 
the limits of the I, I was up against the the edges of what my ideas could communicate and what I felt the human body could communicate and I was needing um uh, a larger pool of resources to draw from to kind of tell the stories I needed to tell and have the conversations that I needed to have and I felt um sort of stuck just using my body and the bodies of others and so it felt then uh you know natural then to expand outwards into all sorts of medium uh mediums and media that I now use okay great and then we the first which is I you know I'm, I'm viewing this piece you know pas de deux, really there's some there's some really edgy things happening in there right which I the more time I spend with the work the more I actually like it and kind of get it <laughs> well that's good to hear yeah I mean I think um <laughs> you know that's a it's a, a newish work I suppose and and I'll, I'll just share my screen so that others can see um they'll see a screen grab but what I'll also do for everyone is um I'll drop a YouTube link into the chat. So, you know, for a bit of homework, people can watch it. And so for a bit of context in 1988, celebrating celebrating our bicentenary, uh, the ABC had the foresight to send out camera crews right across the continent. Uh, and they captured the sort of so-called sentiment of the day. Um, and I was quite struck. So a curator sort of sent this to me saying, hey, you know, I think you might get a kick out of this video. And it just, it really uh, kind of blew my mind, mostly because it actually uh, was quite balanced. You know, you, you generally think that, you know, that things perhaps were worse in the past, particularly in 88, right at this kind of fervor. Uh, it was filmed, sorry, I should say also on, on so-called Australia Day, Invasion Day, however, however you might sort of call it. Um, and I mean, even that as a project to sort of go out into the world and film an entire sort of documentary length film all in one day, you know, such a great idea, you know. Yeah. Um, and so initially I was interested just, I guess, in, in, in the, in, I guess, the language and the, the kind of the um, this sort of snapshot or, or um, moment that was kind of crystallized on celluloid. And um, I wanted to interrogate it, right? And so... I removed or redacted, I suppose, uh, everything that initially that I thought or struck me as, as racist, what I felt kind of reflected the racist attitudes of the time. Um, but it felt then unbalanced. So I applied the same logic to what I felt or considered to be the um, unracist uh, side of the same sort of story from that particular day. Uh, and initially they didn't exist side by side. And then the real sort of magic happened, I guess, when I, when I did collide them in a single screen or, or, or you know in a single work and suddenly they were vibrating against each other which felt a lot uh closer to to perhaps the attitudes of the day and unfortunately the attitudes of today yeah yeah i mean i think um that it's an interesting that's an interesting point isn't it the attitudes in 88 and the attitudes in where are we 2021 mm -hmm. like what what indeed might have changed. And it's funny, isn't it? Because I, I do feel as though we've gone round from say 88, these various circles have changed. And obviously some things have changed, technologies have changed, other things have kind of happened. But I'm wondering whether, you know, on reflection within this work, whether you do feel as though there is a, there is still the need to make these kind of critical interventions around identity politics and issues of belonging. I mean, I think, in, unfortunately, there always will be that need. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, as much of a utopianist as I am uh, and an optimist, um, you know, I think that there will always perhaps, unfortunately, be someone marginalised. I think that actually the issue with that is that we, we hold on to an idea of a centre, a centre then by sort of default necessitates an edge or a margin. Um, and I mean, I think one of the, I guess, the sort of the subtext to, to my project at large is, a, is a, an idea that I kind of borrowed from uh, Okwi and Weza and this uh, colonial constellation. I think that if we can separate ourselves from a kind of centrist, non-centrist or, or, or like a dichotomy thinking and, and start to think about constellations of, of effect, cause and effect and constellations of relationships, then we may start to see or have a less of a need to kind of have work that is is as charged uh, as as this work in this particular space. But I think 
with the work too, I mean, what strikes me uh, most about the, the difference in time, I think it, it perhaps could be a question of class because I think the, a lot of the, the racist or more racist comments that come out of the video, like one of the kind of main monologues is, is from a guy sailing his yacht in Sydney Harbour. And now our kind of most, at least, of our sort of more wealthier classes are much more conscious, uh, much more kind of, um, uh, you know, doing what they can to kind of appear to be more into the zeitgeist. Whereas perhaps the the uh, it's less so in other other parts of society. I've lost you. Or maybe, you? maybe Dean, that level of kind of. Um um cultural arrogance and confidence by that class has now had to be repressed because you do come you know did that make I, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking has it gone away or has it just been veneered over well you know? I think re repressed might be a, a very good word for it I think you you actually could be quite right unfortunately and you know I think perhaps the um as optics and visibility uh, become uh, much more sort of you know, your average person has an understanding of corporate visibility, corporate responsibility, mm. and the people that reflect those roles, um, then perhaps you're right, perhaps, it, it, which in, in some ways is worse, isn't it? I mean, if things are on the surface, you know what you're dealing with, you know. Yeah, but um, we've, talked, we've talked a lot about that idea of kind of repressed and the disavowal and the colonial denial and the fact that these are very difficult and uncomfortable histories and the very idea that unless we have these uncomfortable conversations, and maybe they will always be uncomfortable, mm. maybe, you know, in terms of that imperial history, that it is, you know, something like a, a bitter ingredient in the conversation, yeah. you know, that you're going to be in the ring, the cultural ring, it is going to be a fight, and they're going to be bloody noses, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, it's not going to come out comfortable, but that's an important sense of contact. Mm. that people feel a bit like bit like boxers if you like it's very strange isn't it how nine times out of ten they'll always embrace each other after the after yeah, the right. after, after the scene you know or or, mm. or or those fight moments where there's a degree of respect that something some horrible entangled history has at least had an attempt at least gone head to head mm. at least recognize the kind of difference the physicality of the politics of that contestation is then kind of like in a cathartic way had its moment right mm -hmm. at its moment so when i was thinking about this video piece these kind of moments i think having them are really i think you know as kind of like black people on the planet that that in, in many ways i think they're not necessarily for us right no that's right <laughs> yeah well, it's our lived experience you know this is nothing new for for anybody that's you know in any of our sort of similar positions and i think and I think that is where hopefully works like this can can sort of operate. You know, they have a dual focus, I suppose. You know, the you know, I guess you, you you're often thinking of like, who is this work for? Who what who am I trying to kind of really get to? And I think, you know, in some ways this is a work made for our mob, you know, but it's also a work um, reflecting back out, you know, and sort of saying, well, look, you know, this this is. Um, uh, you know, in a true kind of archival post-colonial sense, like here it is, this is, you know, I've, I've, I haven't really changed this in any way. All I've done is, is reduce or, or kind of... Uh, kind of uh, condense. Edit, yeah, that's right. But I mean, I haven't, there's no kind of affectation on, from my part. And I was very clear to sort of be quite strict with, with my kind of conceptual rules as to how I built the work. And, and I think, you know, you sort of mentioned it also, like, where it gets really interesting is where they start to overlap or collide the, the, the themes that are being spoken about or the action that's happening. And again, that was, that was chance, you know, I mean, I, I didn't construct any of that and the, you know, what happens sort of beautifully and you know, you're kind of doing something right when, when, when the universe is on your side, you know, but um, the, the right channel, the, the non-racist channel just sort of by chance ended up being twice as long as the racist channel. So I thought, well, I've right. got all this extra time. I'll just double it. And of course, how perfect, because, you know, historically and perhaps still, you know, that side of the story gets twice as much opportunity to talk, right? We're still kind of yeah. balancing that one out. So it seems, you know, to make sense. I think that you, you mentioned the word mob as well. I think it's a fantastic word. And again, looking at looking at your work and it's a it's a it's a funny it's a funny word, isn't it? This this idea of, you know, who's this mob? It feels very it feels very. What's the word? Ancient. There's a term, there's a mob of people coming around the corner. 
And yet at the same time, it's got, again, within the work, which, which is what I think is, a, you know, an undercurrent, a, a recurring theme within your, within the thing, is it's got this duality within it, hasn't it? It's like, there's them and then there's us. Mm -hmm. There's that mob over there as a sense of threat. And then I be, then there's the fact that I belong to a mob, right? So there's that, there's that sense of, um, um, there's that sense of kind of, you know, encounter within that space, right? which is really kind of, um, you know, kind of dealing with the dualities of how language plays within your work, I think is really important. Right? Yeah, I mean, and I, I like the, um, the, the challenge that that throws down, you know, and, and it's a reminder both to me, but hopefully to the viewer that things are slippery and they should be, you know. Uh, we, you know, we don't want necessarily things to be uh, fixed, singular, uh, stuck down, you know. I like those spaces where things can kind of um, be a little bit a little unclear, you know, a little kind of ambiguous, or 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 be clear but be clear in two separate places. You know what I mean? With this work, for example, you know, with its title, tactical overcoming, you know, it's a I'm using, I guess, that title to describe an action. You know, it, uh, what could be a, an organized uh, situation of of a, a group, an angry mob. Um, yeah. But of course, um, with the broader context of, of myself, my practice, it does have obviously multiple kind of readings, but it still does sort of, um, you know, yeah. I think it's an interesting word because I, I always think of like lynch mob and it's got those yeah. kind of negative, you know, in terms of, an, in terms of a um, North American context, it kind of, kind of comes with a sense of disorganized disorganized but but um, singular as a yes. mob in end yeah. right and i like the idea of thinking about again you know the idea of what kind of tactics do we employ kind of you know our you know movements for example mm -hmm. or you know linking to you know various cultural and theoretical kind of positions about you know i mean in the uk for example you know, I think our black cultural theorists, everyone was kind of, you know, linking to, desperately linking to, in some senses, trying to find the right words to help their work become, um, you know, understandable through a kind of, you know, chaotic um, sense of belonging. And this kind of tactical overcoming with the idea of mob in it. I'm not sure, but I'm, I, I wanted to. I wanted to explain the um, the 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 orange the, the O at some point. The, the kind of use of that, but I, but I do think this idea of um, you know membership mm. for me is really an interesting term, especially through the lens of autograph, and especially through the lens of in the '80s, all these collectives that you know we had, you know, um, film collectives, people like Sankofa, you know, Black Audio Film Collective. You know, there was autograph, which in many ways was that membership type space. There was all these places where people were trying to join. Mm -hmm. So the, the sense of collective was really important. And I think really what happened by the mid 90s is that the, you know, the, the impacts here in the UK of say like the YBA, Young British mm -hmm. Artists, mm -hmm. meant that people became much more um, singular in their, in their understanding of what they wanted their practice to be. Mm -hmm. Artists with a capital A. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the yellow, the, I mean, it's a bit of a kind of, it's almost a recurring gag. And I think you're sort of, you're quite on the money there in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's close enough, right. To the, the yellow, the center of our flag, the sun, our life country. And, and I think that, I mean, at least I hope that, other Aboriginal people, they see a yellow circle and they know that, that I'm speaking to them, you know. Um, it's a kind of a code that appears quite regularly in my work, a specific kind of, I mean, it's, it's really even a specific pigment that I like, PY37. Um, that is this, it's, it's, it's just the, the perfect kind of cadmium warm it is you know deep deep cadmium depending on the brand but it, it gets right. that 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 sense of uh warmth that sense of um kind of overwhelming sort of uh calmness almost that you can feel on country and you can feel amongst your mob right and right. um so it's home 
Yeah, in some ways, that's exactly right. But I mean, I think to, you know, in this particular painting, um, it's sort of, it's also almost kind of head-like, you know, I'd be reluctant again to pin it down that specifically, but, you know, it could also be maybe the outer edge of a target, um, you know, and I mean, the circle is a complicated space in Aboriginal art, um, especially as a non-desert painter. Um, and so the, the kind of, there's a, an ongoing kind of interest, I guess, I have in, in how to address what I kind of call the Papania dot or the Western Desert dot and the, the perceptions of Aboriginal art. And another one of my kind of um, sort of quests, my side projects is to, to play my part in expanding that language of, of understanding more broadly of what can constitute Aboriginal art, you know, I think uh, perhaps- Well, yeah, I mean, there was, a, there, there was a certain sense, especially going, I mean, I, I know this piece is more recent, were we 2018, mm. but there was, I think I would say, I mean, when I think about history, I'm talk, you know, it, it's funny when we talk about time. I mean, I think the things that we're, I think the things that we're, we're, we're touching on here are issues of time, mm -hmm. um, different cos cosmologies, different ways of thinking. Mm opening and de and delinking from the kind of stereotypical way that um, history is framed, you know, mm -hmm. indigenous conversations or racialized subjects mm -hmm. in, 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 the, in, in the kind of psyche of uh, Eurocentric thought. Mm -hmm. Then there's the question, isn't there, around um, uh, how representation works? How do we do that work? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think often the body has been really quite problematic, use mm -hmm. of the black body in, in our work. Mm -hmm. How do we, you know, do we replicate the kind of pornography of racism, if you like, if that mm. makes, if that is a term? And um, so I think there's been a real, a real challenge around representation of politics. What do you do with it? It's almost as if every cultural term um, we have with, with 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 representations of the black body become fragmented, if you like. And then it's not surprising that we um, we we people artists move towards ideas of abstraction, yes. which means that we can open up a different kind of door, open up a different kind of cosmology where the documentary, if you like, the storytelling in a straight form doesn't really, doesn't really help us at all, right? Doesn't really, that doesn't really do its work. So we've had to break the, have to break the rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, that, that's where artists like yourself are at the kind of forefront of travel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, prefer tra I, prefer I, I travel hope so. Rather than research. Exactly. Well, I, think, I think, I think it is travel, you know, I've become more of a kind, I've become more of a, you know, I love the idea of time and travel and just refusing to be located in this time and thinking about where do we, where do we travel? What does, what, what does that mean? Rather than being locked in the past, which is important, you can bring that as cultural baggage to your, to your, to your future destination. But once we don't know where we're going and allow that to happen, then we can do things like, you know, work with, um, work with, say, the work you've done with Polly Borland's portraits mm -hmm. right we can do different work with it right mm -hmm. we can we, we can take the world and its material culture and start to bend it into a way that works for us or for different possible audiences so i was wondering if we could move on to um poly Australis, which i think is a is a, is a conversation with photography mm -hmm. um a conversation with media a conversation with, with with identity and of course a conversation with history so if we could just take us through some of the work that some some of the ideas that were behind this intervention specifically with the photographic i can indeed i think you know one of the things uh, initially and you touched on this yourself is this idea of time right so i i came across an exhibition catalog of uh, a commission that polly Borland was given between the national portrait gallery in london and our own national portrait gallery here the commission was from 2000, a kind of millennium, um, you know, art extravaganza. Um, but I was struck initially at this, this small book with such a big word as its title, Australians was the collective title of this um, exhibition, huge. You know, I think there's, there's almost 50 or about 50 or so um, images that make up the entire body of work. You know, it's a big kind of commission. Um, but yeah, I, I found this big word on such a tiny little book and I found that to be so curious, you know, what a bold statement um, for a book to make. And then, of course, as I looked through it and I realised more and more what I was looking at and unfortunately, predictably, every face was white, bar one, you know, and 
edit, I mean, why the editor decided to put the, the one non-black face on the very last page, I'll never know. Um, but it's difficult not to. It's difficult not to take that personally. You know, Uncle Herb Wharton, a poet, is 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 the is the um, the only kind of non-white um, person in, included in this you know, commission. And so then it just felt natural then to kind of you know attack it quite physically with my permanent marker straight onto the the document, straight onto the hard copy itself, and you know both deface uh, but redress rebalance you know kind of um uh do what i guess i could in a sense of um uh i guess you know taking back reclaiming i mean i think that's a strategy that's often used especially photographically a lot of re uh, performance of old photo works or that kind of thing but um this was i guess my way of of uh addressing that i mean too there's this kind of you know uh inverse of blackface I suppose you know none of the faces ever um I was careful and conscious never to kind of go over the faces of anybody which feels actually very violent um yeah. Yeah. you know to to do that to someone even someone like Celeste Patterson sitting on the toilet um you know but I mean what a perfect example of um of a really complicated space of identity you know Mm. I think it's rec- I, I, I think I think what is it's it's there's that space where um in, in a funny kind of way I feel sad and then I feel kind of um positive positive because people can act mm. but sad because we you know through the agency of autograph and through the agency of conversations or supporting artists there is this reclaiming work mm. which is quite a quite an it's like um each time something is claimed you look up to the mountain and you've mm. still got you know base mm. camp, you're still at base camp one mm. because there's so much to reclaim whether it's mm. you know Agassi's photographs at the moment in terms of whether it's um you know Benin bronzes whether it's the museum mm. whether it's you know our family heritage all the all the all the I'm going to be very base here but all the shit that's kind of you know in mm. there Absolutely. The further you go down, the deeper you know the mine is. It's it, it seems you know, and I, and I think it's that that reclaiming work can also be very suffocating. Yes, yeah, and I think you know coming back to to, to sort of where we were headed before. I mean, part of now what I'm thinking about is um, a, a sort of not a refusal to go there, but I understand now that you know primarily my role is a cult is one of those, of a culture maker. Um, and that, you know, really what, what my, my sort of position is to do is to, to claim my right, my agency to work in any space, however I choose, because white people do that, or, you know, yeah. uh, the people in the centre, let's say, you know, and so if, if, if they have a right to claim that kind of agency within their work, within their project, then why not me? You know, why yeah. not anybody? Um, and so that when that kind of clicked, you know, because I did go through a process and I think it was a kind of a learned process looking to my predecessors and understanding my kind of role in a sort of making contemporary art um uh you know a lot of really excellent artists have done a lot of really excellent work before i've come along i think and I, I choose to believe at least to allow me to be able to kind of feel and say that i have that agency that right to make work however i choose in whatever way i choose um without being bound to some external idea about uh, what the work is supposed to look like or how it should operate or um, how deep down that mine it needs to go let's, to um, justify. Just while you're talking, let's look at another couple of the slides from yeah. the, um, from, from there as well. Just give the give people a sense of uh, how the intervention worked. Oh, that's, this um, is fun. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, I mean, there's, um, this this the, we're, we're, again we've been working about claiming the right to freedom one might ask the, you know the, the idea of yeah, you know, freedom, absolutely. freedom and not to walk in not not to walk into the conversation as a i guess as a representative but i think um uh that represent i'm not sure whether that representative work will ever be over and i think i'm, I'm, I'm but, but freedom is a march isn't it it's just yeah. We never, we never really get there as well. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm again becoming more inclined with the idea that nothing will be, not nothing, not nothing will be achieved in a negative sense, but each time we make um, a pronouncement, mm. 
each time an utterance is made or a mark is made, the dynamic changes mm -hmm. around where around how we see the map. Mm -hmm. And rather than this idea of fixed boundaries, that we this is where I love the idea of walkabout and the <laughs> the idea that each time you go into um, each time you go into the landscape, there's another encounter. There's yes. a, there's a, there's another that there's another cosmology on you. There's another sense of uh, possibilities which you might discover. So there is no discovery other than the act of being. Yes, beautifully put. And I mean, I think it, it's making me think of um, cosmological study. You know, as our equipment gets better, as let's continue the metaphor, as our telescopes get better, so too does the edges of that universe expand and the clarity that we have. Um, you know, I think for however many trillions of galaxies we're aware of, I'm sure there's trillions more that we're yet to find. Um, yeah. And it's a similar process, right? You know, we, we may kind of expand our understanding of our, of, our, of our place galactically, but we know also the universe is growing. Um, and I think, and I think one of the, one of the, I think one of the, I think really what, what um, part, you know, small part or major part, I don't really know, of the work we've been trying to think about, you know, consciously or unconsciously, at autograph is just how do you signpost some of that stuff, right? How do you mm -hmm. how do you signpost it? You know, you know, I've uh, uh, you know been I've been you know been fascinated with Rotomi Fanny Coyote's work for since 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 seeing it in the very first moment, really, mm -hmm. not nearly not necessarily even understanding why, but just mm -hmm. intuitively, you know, feeling the work. I mean. You know, when 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 colleagues at Autograph, you know, Rennie and I, Rennie Musai and I talk, we often only try and get to the conversation where you know the conversation's working, you know the visuals working, you know the place where the artist is working when the goosebumps arrive, right? Mm -hmm. That's so right. you want to feel the hair on the back of your neck. Now that's the point of inarticulation, mm -hmm. which indicates to me that something special has arrived. And that's something special ar arriving can be in the form of the word, the photograph, or, you know, the, the, uh, the exchange. And it's not always verbal or visual, right? It's that sense of proximity mm -hmm. is also, I think some people are very good at um, of sharing their proximity. Mm -hmm. And I think that idea of, you know, the, uh, the, the artist's mark is a simple invitation when it goes well to mm -hmm. share my prox to share proximity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, I agree. Please continue. So, so no, no, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm just trying to like think when I read, you know, a dingo ate, a dingo ate your baby, mm -hmm. I can hear all of just in those four or five words, you can hear all of the isms, the racism, the fearism, the lie, the denial, mm -hmm. the kind of tragedy of, in, of the, the tragedy of all of that on so mm -hmm. many levels, right? And to just bring just a signpost that through an echo. <laughs> of what might have been said or what might have been remembered because exactly. i think she actually said a dingo ate my baby right <laughs> that's right that's right and so i mean this this was a vindication almost you know i was thinking a lot about um in miscarriages of justice you know here in australia at the time i was developing the work there was a lot of media talk about um manus island and our treatment of, of refugees and i was interested in in trying to find a collision between that what I consider that to be a great injustice, um, an embarrassment on on our on our kind of entire society, um, and then Lindy Chamberlain's injustice, an innocent woman, um, and I mean the the more that I I kind of researched uh, how the whole Lindy Chamberlain uh, story saga tragedy, as you say, unfolded, the worse and worse it got, um, and so I wanted to make this work. Um, in a way, almost just sort of reach out to Lindy and say, you know, it, a dingo did eat your baby. That, that is what happened. But of course, you know, as the work progressed, um, it really started to become about um, what I kind of started to call the Australian Gothic or the yeah. kind of the fear, the, the colonial fear of retribution, which I think that you still see present in a lot of the kind of, racially motivated tensions that arise today well um, you know I, I think we should stay with that that's a really good good um, anchor this this idea of colonial fear mm. 
that you know work like this can you scroll to the to the installation of it in the space with the metal okay yeah yeah like, like there there in therein lies a kind of com you know a really strong articulation of colonial fear the sense that you know what you, what you've done <laughs> is not you know the the, the the repressed it's that kind of tony morrison beloved moment isn't it mm -hmm. in terms of uh, in, in terms of that that those ghosts coming through and i wrote i wrote something recently um quoting somebody else about how these ghosts can only scream because nobody's listening right beautiful <laughs> Wow. So yeah. they only they they, they 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 can't come at you and say, look, you know, um, help me or, or 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 there's there's no offering there. It's because they are completely shut out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, over t o over time, and the longer that gets repressed, the louder it becomes. You know, the or the more horrific, or the more the more things that have to be thrown around the room, the more you know, the, the more other dynamics that will 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 dis the, the disturbance gets louder and louder mm -hmm. and louder in that space. And I, it, you know, this this also remo reminds me. Look, it, it, this this piece is like in conversation with, say, an artist like you know Mona Hatoum's work. You know, mm -hmm. this idea of the the repressive nature of the state is really quite fundamental when, when, I, when I look at that. So I was wondering if you just take us through a little, a little bit, you know, a, a little bit more in terms of what was happening in this space. Yeah, well, I think you know, I, I really um, the more that I interrogated both Manus Island. Uh, both subjectively but objectively and the Chamberlain story, the the overlap, the collision um, sort of became quite astounding, you know, even to the point where, um, you know, her prison cell wasn't that much different in size, right, to, the, to some of the cells that are given to the detainees on the island. And I think that really, you know what you can't see in this video in this image also is down by the, the blow up bed um is a copy of um picnic at hanging rock um right. you know which i think uh with a bookmark actually which is a a, a vintage photograph um of Uluru. and i think you know that picnic at hanging rock um again to me when i read it uh is about this kind of the ghosts you say and i think this this lingering threat of uh of retribution and the the undeniable uh truth that it will be deserved you know and i think that that's part of the one of the at least one of the most interesting things that kind of keeps me returning to these themes is the disconnect you know so often the counter argument from non-aboriginal people you know, the boring kind of rote thing is like nothing to do with us, you know, we didn't do anything wrong or whatever. But for Aboriginal people, those ghosts, that they, they're still everywhere. You know, that scream you talk about, we hear that, we see that, we feel that. Um, and so it's not that we are disconnected through temporal kind of ways to, to these events, they're still very real. Um, and so I guess I was hoping to in that work, in this sort of work, um, find that place that, I don't know, something uncomfortable, right? And I guess, you know, one of my silly jokes in the work is, is you know, there's nothing more uncomfortable than when you've got sand in the bed. You know, you go, you go to the beach, wherever you go on holiday, you have an afternoon yeah. nap, right? And you get some sand in your bed and it's just, it's the worst, you know? But imagine living like that, right? Imagine being stuck on Manus Island and that's, you know, you're not on holiday and your bed is, always full of sand. Uh, 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 and again carrying on with that the the idea that you've uh, you know um the idea that you have to live with sand in your bed kind of you know metaphorically yeah yeah well that's right the uncomfortable nature of uh, of being i think for me just 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 to carry on with that conversation it's it's not like you've um you know, if you've had a fun day and you've gone to the beach and you've got sand in your bed, that's quite the consequence. So that can almost work as like a reminder of uh, of uh, of the craziness. But you know, somehow the sheets are going to be cleaned out and it's all it's all going to mm. be fine. That, that's mm. kind of kind of good. But when you when 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 there's when somebody somewhere is constantly pouring sand in your bed, that's right. and you can't actually get it out, and you haven't you, you're wondering where it's coming from all the time, mm -hmm. and you and and it or even sand in your face yeah. <laughs> to be even more more blunt you're just lying on the beach and someone happens to run too close to you why because they just don't recognize your body or they exactly. don't respect your presence so you're always chewing on that glassy stuff 
in your yeah. mouth. And when you begin to speak, it's not surprising that sometimes it sounds a bit sharp, sounds a bit edgy. Why? Because you've been swallowing that shit for a long time, right? Yes, and you've been exactly. dealing with that uncomfortable place for a long time. And one of the things I realized in relation to, let's just say the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, is that, you know, you do, and then the, the, the actually, not so much the demonstration part of that, it's the it's the um, it's the the after stuff mm. or the wake, as Christina Sharp talks about. It's the stuff of turbulence after where people want to want to do something with you or ask you to help them out of this space that they've yes. created. <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, look, I know. I mean, here in Australia, we have we have NAIDOC week, you know, um, and it's the one week a year where about three weeks out, your inbox just starts getting flooded with requests. You know, mm -hmm. um, can you give this talk? Can you, can you do this? We want you on this panel. We want you to do this. Often unpaid, I'll add as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and you, every time you're sort of reminded that whilst perhaps a lot of these, these uh, there's best intentions often, you know, a lot of organizations that really are trying to kind of think and do the right thing. You know, they think that NAIDOC week um, is the right time. But of course, you know, all it does is reinforce um, that it is only this one week. Um, uh, and I guess part of what we were trying to do within this kind of conversation is to put that on the table, right? Is mm -hmm. to say, you know, we can't, you, you know, is to unlock that kind of, um, well, unconscious bias, one, one thing, you know, is to, is, to, is, to, is to begin to ask people to invite in, is begin to think curatorially about inviting the conversations, the difficult conversations, into the mainstream, if you like. By the way, you know, I do think this this, this idea of the mainstream and the margins. I'm, I also reject that. I'm not. I'm just not interested in that center. That no. that's all. And I think you know yeah. what's great about artists, say like say Carrie Mae Weems in North America, or say. Um, you know, I'm thinking here, here, here in the UK, people that have got that sense of Steve McQueen, we might argue, is that mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're 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 um, unreserved, unreservedly. I can never say that word. Unreservedly centering their world, right? Yes. Yeah. And if you yeah. don't understand that world, wrote to me Fanny Coyote as well, and in, in you know um, uh, Ingrid Pollard, and uh, even I mean, the great Maud Salter before she passed, unreservedly centering their world. It's like I'm not on the margins. Where did you, <laughs> so as soon yeah. as you start talking about those margins, you become, um, you, you're caught. It's like, you know, that that rat trap is in there. That very conversation about, you know, ethnic, yeah. <laughs> blackness, you know, us and them, you know, as soon as you do that, you're, you're, you're back in the coloniality of it all. And it's so hard to uh, to want to, to to not do that. So I'd say you're on you're over there. That's fine. I might be over here, but these are equal centers, and that's why I love this idea of a, of different galaxies, different universes, different gravities. Right? Mm -hmm. If you're not if if, you, if you're if you're not if, if you you will never know my world mm -hmm. if you don't allow yourself to free flow into the gravitational pull, the energy that we have here. And by the way, when you let go, a bit like dancing, a bit like jazz, a bit like all kinds of things, when you let go, when you let that freedom arrive, mm -hmm. it can be incredibly pleasurable, right? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be painful. No, so let no. go. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, what a beautiful way to end. I think we should, I don't know if we're going to end any better than that, but I think perhaps now is a good time to um, open up to questions if there are any. I'm going to stop There's sharing my screen, there. everybody. Um, and so let's just see, people, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat um, or you can just scream them out through your Zoom. I can't see any questions. Okay. And if you have no questions, we'll, um, you know, we'll just keep talking away. Because I think, you know, um, one thing that I think too I want to pick up on is the, um, is the use of language, you know, because you sort of said it yourself, because as soon as you start using those phrases, margin, using the language, you're back into de uh, into colonial thinking. And I think, you know, decolonial is, is a word you obviously know quite well. Um, but I think that true, at least in my, my world, true decolonialization happens in here. Yeah. It has to happen here first before we can start seeing any kind of um, structural or, or um, you know, or the feedback from decolonial sort of practices. Um, well, it's a tool. The word, I think it's, a, you know, language is a tool and the, the decolonizing ideas, another tool. It will evolve. Um, mm. 
might it, it might not be the uh, the end game as, as we such, but at least it's a tool in the box that we mm. can begin to apply. It, it causes discomfort, um, and I think until we're all a little bit more comfortable, we will continue to enjoy some aspects mm, absolutely. Of, uh, of, of discomfort. And I think that's where some of the pleasure can can lie going into places that we don't feel comfortable. So I'm really mindful that we've been given a a message in here which says please wrap up in <laughs> one or two minutes <laughs> because I, I don't know, I don't know where the time's gone. But they're gonna I'm gonna say listen Dean let's keep talking. Um, it's been a real pleasure yes. to share some time with you and to get to know your work better. And uh, you know um, onwards is all we can really say. And thanks very much Dean. Thank you Lovely. very much. Look forward to it. Ciao.